Uh, to everyone who took Aliyahs this morning, to all of our Torah readers. Um, we're going to turn now to BZBI's Rabbi Emeritus, Rabbi Ira Stone, uh, and it is our uh, treat this morning to have Rabbi Stone as our Darshan. Shabbat Shalom. Shabbat Shalom. Just a moment, how do I do this? Okay. Um, well, it's uh, not a very new or radical idea to say that the Torah is a template for interpretation. But we often don't fully appreciate how important that fact is particularly because the Torah is so magnificently constructed as a na narrative, we are often seduced by the narrative and we ask ourselves, what did such and such a character say? Or why did he say this? Or why did he do that? But the example of our sages is precisely to disconnect from the narrative and try to discover the existential insights, both of the original authors, whoever they may have been, and perhaps more importantly, how the nuggets of insights they left for us help us understand better our own place in the universe. Therefore, um, let us disconnect from the flow of the narrative we've just been reading for a moment and consider for, for, for one of the most famous of these nuggets of insight in our own light. I call heaven and earth to witness against you this day. I have put before you life and death, blessing and curse. Choose life if you and your offspring would live. For a moment, I'm tempted to end my remarks right there. Rather than explain or fill with pious cliches, it seems to me possibly sufficient to repeat this phrase a few times, somewhat meditatively, and allow it to penetrate our consciousness in the fashion of poetry which is what it is at its deepest level. Can one imagine a more appropriate phrase for the time we are living through? Can one imagine a more appropriate phrase to keep in our mouths and our hearts as we prepare to enter into the majesty of the High Holy Days? A majesty no, in no way less majestic because of the new and strange format we will be using to negotiate them. Yet, if we are going to be true to the idea that the Torah is a template for interpretation, it is incumbent on us not merely to meditate, but to interpret. And what interpretation means is certainly to put ourselves into the crucible of the text, to internalize the solemnity and the power of the commanding voice that is here imagined. Why should the voice be assigned such power? In other words, before we even get to the content of the verse, what is the significance of the voice? Obviously, a commanding voice can be understood as being external from us. That is, it is not something we make up but something we encounter. It may be mediated by a human voice, as here the voice of God is mediated by the voice of Moses. But whether mediated or encountered directly, it is real, and it comes to us from outside of ourselves, from that which is other than us. It explodes our self-containment. The other puts our concern for ourselves in question. It is essential that we understand that what the Torah presents as the voice of God, however we understand that phrase, is not the God within. 
it comes to us from outside and puts our very selfhood in question. We are not a true self until we've been interrupted by another. And that other that puts our self-containment in question is not only to be understood as the other people or even the sentient beings around us, but rather the entirety of material reality itself. The heavens and earth put themselves before us as a question, a question that contains all other questions that might be asked of us. The questions that force us to see the humanity of all human beings and ask ourselves how we choose life in the context of human society. The question that forces us to see the sanctity of all the disparate creatures of the natural world and asks us how we choose life in the context of husbandry and agriculture. All are subsumed by the overarching question, how do we choose life in the context of the cosmos itself? Are these questions too big for you? Are they so enormous that we end up feeling absolved from answering them? In the face of that possibility, the Torah responds, you are confronted at every moment by the possibility of death, the indigenous curse, as it were, built into life. And if you do not choose to ask yourself how to live, you will surely die. And with your death, your offspring and their offspring will certainly die. What makes this command a command is that it is unavoidable. What makes the ritual of the Yomim Hanoraim, what makes these days days of awe, is precisely the unav unavoidability of the choice, its commanding nature. To truly live, I believe the Torah is teaching, one must acknowledge the interruption of one's self-containment by the command of the other, the multiple others from nature itself to the next door neighbor, from the members of our own community to the many who suffer from unconscionable abuse built into our nation's deepest infrastructure. We who close ourselves off from the ways in which we continue to abuse humans, animals, forests, the very air we breathe, must be aware that we are consigning ourselves and our offspring to certain death. Self-absorption, either individually or communally, is the Torah's prescription for death. Assuming responsibility for the full range of otherness outside ourselves is the sure prescription for life. We will certainly die, but we can bequeath life or death. This is the choice this verse puts before us, and it has been waiting for our response for millennia. Answering these questions responsibly has not been a hallmark of human society throughout the ages. We are far from the first generation that seems intent on choosing death rather than life. In fact, one might argue that compared to previous generations, we're doing a little better. But at the same time, it appears that the stakes have risen exponentially. In the face of those stakes, the Torah argues strongly against despair. Rather, it calls upon us to recognize just how much power we have, just how powerful the choice for life can be. It is and can be transformative. But the choice needs to be articulated in more than simply words. It is in and through the full panoply of everyday activities that the new consciousness of life choosing must be woven. It is this that gives rise to the idea of mitzvot. The specific acts that constitute mitzvot are historically conditioned. 
more important than what mitzvot our ancestors developed as their answer to the imperative of choosing life is the reality that such a choice requires acts, acts that by furthering the life choosing force, force are sanctified. The real challenge of contemporary Jewish life, and I would suggest perhaps the life of the entire human community, is to identify and enact the sacred acts required by the present moment. The Torah equates life with blessing, and as we've seen, death with curse. What is the connection between life and blessing? Our tradition indicates that blessing is, if you will, a unit of life consciousness. It is a formula we use to recognize that the act we are about to perform is a life choosing act. We are at a moment that requires the development of a host of new blessings to encompass the new acts of life consciousness that these times require. Blessings for acts of environmental justice. Blessings for acts for racial justice. Blessings for acts of compassion for those crushed by the unbridled power of the corporate culture. The old blessings need to be reinvigorated so that we understand they are what I like to call the quanta of life consciousness. The new blessings need to be composed and invoked as responses to the closing in around us of self-absorption that threatens existence itself. The weight and the hope of this Torah verse is that it is a command. The command is not to choose between life and death. Rather, the command is to choose life. We have no choice. We will, the Torah says, choose life. That is the faith of the Torah, one might say. As dark as the sky might seem, the light is only temporarily hidden. What is so awesome about the days of awe is that we have the opportunity, the power to move the darkness aside and let the light in. In fact, we have no choice but to do so. And it will, without doubt, bring blessings into the world. That is my prayer on this Shabbat and the prayer for our community as we begin the High Holy Day season. Shabbat Shalom. Shabbat Shalom and uh, Yishar Koach, it was, um, I, I certainly needed that uh, for my own inspiration coming into Rosh Hashanah. And I'm so grateful for your uh, every year speaking on uh, this Shabbat that uh, Rabbi Annie and I are uh, busy with other thoughts and other preparations. And I uh, want to wish you and uh, your wife, Annie, uh, a Shana Tova Umetuka, a year of, of blessing, a year of peace, and a year of all good things for your family.